Okay, coming up next in our section two here, we're going to talk about the fluids themselves. And we'll start this discussion of hydraulic fluids, the fluids themselves, uh, by talking about their functions and what they do for us. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, this is not in a particular priority order, but I'll just go through these one by one. Okay. Now, has anybody ever driven a car with spongy brakes? All right, spongy brakes. Okay, a car's brake system is a hydraulic system. It's not a circulating type hydraulic system, but it is a hydraulic system. And that sponginess, as you know, almost always comes from having air in the brakes, right? And that's because in a hydraulic system, one of the premises of the fluid in a hydraulic system is that it is not compressible. But air, of course, is very compressible. We have air compressors, right? So that's why air in hydraulic systems is a bad thing. And so one of the things we want a hydraulic system to do is to release air if it gets it in there. Okay? We can spend a lot of time talking about how air gets in. We won't worry about that for right now. So that, but that's an important feature. The next important feature is to split from water. Okay? And it is not too hard to imagine. If any, first of all, if anybody's ever had antifreeze go into their engine oil, it turns into that nice white milky stuff which is also very thin and is not a good lubricant and can trash bearings pretty quickly. That's because, again, it's not a good lubricant. Well, if you get a bunch of water in your hydraulic oil like that, how do you think it behaves in your pump? It'll trash a pump pretty well, unless you've got a... There are systems designed for water content fluids, and we, I'll mention those a little later in here, but in almost all hyd regular hydraulic systems, we want it to separate from water any water that made it into the hydraulic oil, we really want to stay in the bottom of the reservoir. So we want it to be able to split. Okay. We also want to be able to protect the pump. The pump is the biggest metal-to-metal -metal possibility or probability that's going on in a hydraulic system. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of different pump designs. I can put on a two-day class on just talking about hydraulic pumps different designs, we're not going to go into that here, but know that pumps, and particularly the higher pressure you get, the more metal-to-metal -metal contact is going on inside the pump. And so the more we need to protect that pump from wear, and we're going to count on the oil to be able to do that for us. Okay? Uh, mentioned before, we have heat in our systems, so we're going to want our oil to act as a heat transfer agent. And uh, in some in certain applications, um, most notably uh, boom bucket trucks, you know, utility trucks, we want these things, we may want the hydraulic oil to not conduct electricity. Okay, that may be a, a, an important criteria if you got a bucket truck. All right, so those are some of the things we're asking the oil to do for us. Now let's get into some details on what the oil is made of and how it does this stuff for us, okay? So I know everybody signed up for this class who's been to this class before because they wanted a formula. All right, folks, we got you a formula for hydraulic oil today. And our hydraulic oil is base stock plus additives, okay? Which is familiar because most oils are kind of like that. Um, hydraulic oils differ from engine oils in a couple of ways. And one, that they have fewer numbers of additives as compared to engine oils. I don't know if you remember, if you were in our engine oil session, there's this arm length list of all these additives. Well, there's only a handful of additives that are in hydraulic oil at all. And two, the, the overall quantities, the percentage of stuff that's in, of additive that's in hydraulic oil is much lower. The, uh, an engine oil can be 20, 30 percent additives in a really high-end truck engine oil you're less, less than 5% additives in a uh, typical hydraulic oil. All right, so there's just, there is less of it there. They're still effective. So we're going to spend some time talking about both the base oil and the additives uh, in hydraulic oils, okay? And our base oil is the slippery stuff, right? Um, the, the, by far the most common base oil in hydraulic oils is the stuff that gets pumped out of the ground and goes through a refinery and gets all cleaned up and, and see-through and stuff like that and gives us your, gives us your slippery, your basic mineral oil uh, base stocks, 
and like I said, a, a huge proportion of these are uh, used in hydraulic oils. Um, now, the, the, there are varying quality of mineral oil stocks used in hydraulic oils, and that's something uh, you do need to pay attention to from time to time. The second type of base stock used for blending hydraulic oils might be a synthetic. Okay? Synthetics have not only the usual benefit of living longer, of resisting oxidation more than the mineral oils, and that would be a good reason to use if a synthetic hydraulic oil, if you planned on not changing the hydraulic fluid uh, for a very long time. But they also might be chosen due to fire resistance. Okay? Fire resistance may be an important part of it, and there are certain synthetics, not all synthetics, so, but certain synthetics do very good in fire resistance. There are also certain synthetics that are very biodegradable, okay? and uh, those might be required as well. And I've got a little, a few slides on biodegradability later on in the presentation. So we'll talk about that. The third kind of base stock you may have, this is in more in the lines of a specialty product, right? You don't, you don't often see this for mobile equipment, uh, water-based systems. These water-based systems, again, they usually have a specific or a pump designed specifically for the system. So they are really a lot kind of like a, just a high-pressure water pump. Um, some of these things are complete water. Some of them are half water, half oil. And uh, they, then if something starts on fire, at least the water kind of helps snuff it out. There are some that are a combination of glycol and water. I mean, very much like an antifreeze. And you get enough lubricity from the glycol for the, the system. Uh, but they are specialty systems usually with the intent of fire resistance. So you've got a hydraulic system that's right next to a forge, okay, or somewhere where you're rolling ingots in a steel mill. Well, you do need something fire resistant there because any hydraulic leak or blown hose turns into a blowtorch pretty easily. And then the uh, fourth kind of base stock that's out there that you may see from time to time are vegetable-based, vegetable oil-based. These are usually chosen um, because of their biodegradability. And uh, um, vegetable-based stocks generally suffer from not having as good an oxidation life, so they don't last as long in the equipment. They're also very expensive. Some of the, the better ones, the more usable ones, uh, vegetable oils are more expensive than synthetics, actually. Um, but uh, there are places that actually require the use of, of vegetable-based hydraulic oils. All right, so those are our base stocks we're working with to formulate a hydraulic oil. If we go to the additive side of things, that's the other part of our equation. Take a look at the hydraulic fluid additives that we have. The first one we're going to talk about <coughs> real quickly is anti-foam, right? We said that foam in our system was not good for us, so we have additives that actually help release the foam. And the way these work, they don't prevent foam from forming, but what but when foam forms, they allow it to collapse really, really quickly. So it doesn't build up, all right? And it gets out, and it gets out quickly. So that's how uh, anti-foam additives work. Anti-foam additives are actually in many, many industrial oils. And I'm actually non-industrial oils. Most, many, many lubricants have anti-foam additive. Anti-foam additive is also can be treated at a very, very tiny rates. You know, these things are in the 10 parts per million rate in range. So it's just, you just need to, you just need a whiff of it in there, and, they're, and they can be pretty effective. All right, the second class of additives that you'll find in hydraulic oils, and these are whether they're hydraulic oils for low pressure systems or high pressure systems, are the rust and oxidation inhibitors. In fact, this is another additive that finds its way into a whole bunch of oils. Okay, and the key here. It's called a RNO or rust and oxidation inhibitor, and nobody really pays much attention to the rust part of this. Okay, the whole key is on this oxidation, because the oxidation is the reaction where air and hot oil get together and give you black sludge, and nobody wants this in their crankcase, in their gearbox, in their hydraulic system, in their turbine. You know, <laughs> it's just a it's a it's it's d undesirable everywhere. So most oils have some degree of oxidation, of R-N-O additives in it, as well as, and it might be, 
you know, synthetics are very good at fighting oxidation even without the additives. All right, so oxidation's a bad thing. RNO inhibitors definitely in hydraulic oils determines the life of the oil, how long before it starts going bad. Okay. All right, so those are, those are the first two fundamental additives. The third fundamental additive is kind of the granddaddy additive in, uh, in hydraulic oils, and that's anti-wear additives. Okay. Now, if you've been to the, uh, the presentation we did here on um, gear oil and transmission oils or on the one in engine oils, you've probably heard this part of how these things, how anti-wear additives work but I am going to recap it now for anybody who hasn't here, hasn't been here. And you start by thinking about two finely machined metal surfaces, maybe in a bearing or something like that, any engine part. If long as they're separated by a film of oil, they're fine, right? Complete lubrication going on there. But under a microscope, you would notice that these two finely polished surfaces are, are actually a collection of peaks and valleys. All right, at some microscopic scale, you've got these peaks going on. And when you, these peaks rub together, just like rubbing your hands together, what? They heat up, right? And what'll happen is, and then in these two metal surfaces, and their peaks rubbing together, the peaks rub together so hard that they start to get hot, and they end up getting so hot that the peaks will weld to each other, okay? You get two metal peaks on two different surfaces, weld to each other, and then they rip out a chunk of metal from one surface or the other. And now you got chunks of metal and a roughened surface for the next time to go around. And so you start this wear pattern, the cycle of wear, as you keep wearing on this metal surface. Okay? So this is, this is an undesirable phenomenon. All right? And so what we're going to do is put in anti-wear additives to prevent this from happening. Okay, <clears throat> and the way these, um, we want to put a protective layer on these surface peaks. There's my slide. And the way these additives work is they're floating around inside the hydraulic oil. And when these peaks start to get really, really, really hot, they react at that peak by putting a coating on there, a little phosphate coating on each of those peaks. So that the next time that peak comes by another peak, you have phosphate coating um, rubbing each other off and you don't end up with the wear. All right? Here's another, here's another way to think about it. It's like we got our Synergy sales force. They'd mostly just drive around on the streets all day, just driving around. But they get a phone call from somebody who says, oh, I might want to buy something. They're right there, and they're all over them, okay? All right, same thing's going on with this additive, and that's how, that's how anti-wear additives work. Um, this is particularly important in hydraulic systems that operate above 2,000 PSI or so, maybe 1,800, 2,000 PSI. That's when the metal-to-metal -metal surface, and this metal-to-metal -metal contact is going on primarily in the pump. You're really protecting the pump at this stage, okay? So that's... Uh, that's the important part of that. Anti-wear additives are usually zinc-based. So if you hear about zinc anti-wear, that's the kind of anti-wear additive that's usually used in here. There's an important exception uh, we'll talk about later. The treat level is around between 300 and 600 parts per million. Okay? And it's the, it's the same anti-wear chemistry that's used in engine oils. All right, uh, this, this chemistry, this zinc chemistry has been around since the 30s, um, and it's done such a fine job, it's really never been replaced in most cases. Uh, the difference between the engine oil situation and these guys, uh, we said this is anywhere 300 to 600 parts per million in hydraulic oil. Uh, passenger car motor oil might be around 750 parts per million. Heavy duty 15W40, maybe 1,200 parts per million. So it's the same additive technology, but there's less of it in a mainstream anti-wear type hydraulic oil. But still does, still does a good job. Okay, so that's the anti-wear additives 
in our hydraulic oil. And you'll see, I mean, most hydraulic oils with anti-wear will have that designation often in the name as AW. All right, that's, that's usually in the name. Um, sometimes heavy duty or HD is part of it. And usually it doesn't take long to determine whether it's got it in there because it's, mm, it's very commonly used, very commonly used. Um, there are a few additional additives we're going to talk about that are used in certain specialty hydraulic oils, okay? So we covered the ones that are used in almost everybody, right? Now here's kind of the odd guys. Um, hit on a few of these. Um, additives in the specialty hydraulic oils. Dispersants are the first one, okay? And this runs counter to what you would think if once you understand that a dispersant is like a detergent. You know, it's, it's keeping stuff in suspension. And we already said we wanted our hydraulic oil ordinarily to split from water, right? Well, there are some cases in some hydraulic systems that are so critical to being kept clean. Those servo valves are so uh, so critical to being kept clean that you really would rather keep them clean and run the risk of getting some water in that system because these dispersant additives in a hydraulic oil will not split with water but but the uh, process and the equipment so important that you're going to go ahead and put in some detergent just to keep it clean and hopefully you've designed a system that won't allow water to get into it. So dispersants are kind of an odd duck out there of, of additives, but they are, there are dispersant-based hydraulic oils uh, available. Uh, dyes, okay? Dyes are a complete option in hydraulic oils, um, um, sometimes used for identification or leak detection. Uh, there's a, uh, a, hydro a tractor hydraulic oil from Chevron that's got a dye in it that we sell. Uh, that one's kind of orange. Um, Kendall has a product, uh, hydraulic oil used for lift trucks that we um, sell. It's dyed blue. You may or may not see dye out there. <coughs> and then there's the viscosity modifiers. Okay, is everybody ready to dive into the world of chemistry? Uh, my, 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 uh, my early morning session of this, I didn't kill anybody doing this, so I thought I'd try it again. All right. Here's what goes on inside of our oil that we have, a, <coughs> a regular hydraulic oil. We've got these oil molecules that get floating around. They're just good bopping around at room temperature. When we heat up the oil, they start moving faster, and they're bouncing off each other faster and moving around a lot faster. Okay? And what else happens to oil when we heat it up? What do we observe about it? Does it get thin? Yeah. Oil thins out because of all this excess motion going on by these molecules because they're all hepped up from the heat. Okay, so that's what's going on in there. Well, a viscosity modifier additive is the special kind of molecule we put in there, synthetic kind of thing, and it's about the same size as the other molecules. So at room temperature, it's doing its ordinary thing, and it's not, doesn't, it doesn't affect the viscosity or the motion of anything going on at all. You just don't know what's there at room temperature, okay? But then we start to heat up our oil and heat up these viscosity modifier additives, okay? And what they do is they start expanding, okay? Like some, some monster that Tony Stark and Thor and Captain America are gonna have to battle in the next Marvel Avengers movie, right? They got these tentacles that go out everywhere and they're grabbing everything. And all of our molecules that were bouncing around because they were heating up. Remember, this is all getting heated up. What are they doing? They keep running into these arms, and they're slowing down, right? So what happens to our viscosity? Well, it doesn't really thicken up, but what it does do is it doesn't thin anywhere near as fast, okay? Our oil molecules that want to bounce around can't bounce around as much as they could because they're running into these tentacles. So our oil doesn't thin as much when we heat it up. And that's what gives you a multi-grade oil. That's what, that's what, you, the, that's what a, a 15W40 is, an oil that's kind of 15W, and it's got a bunch of this additive that makes it behave like a 40 once you heat it up. All right, that's what these, adi that's what these particular viscosity modifier additives do. So when you've got a multi-grade 
uh, hydraulic oil, um, you definitely have this kind of additive in there. Okay. All right, that's enough chemistry. I'll, I, I'll, I'll quiz you on this later, though. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there are several ways to categorize hydraulic oils uh, and products out there, and so I chose, I chose a system um, to divide it into three groups that we would have industrial-type hydraulic oils. Um, we'll have what I call the off-road or mining-type hydraulic oils, stuff that's used in yellow metal, and then agricultural-related the ag hydraulic oils, okay? So we'll take each of these one at a time and tell you a little bit about what makes them unique or how they're, how they're thought of and in the, in how the industry treats them. Take a look at industrial hydraulic oils. And the first thing we'll look at here is the uh, viscosity grade system, okay? These things are graded by the ISO viscosity grade system, which is 32, 46, and 68 are by far the most common grades. And those ISO numbers go below 32 and above 68, so but I'm not going to give you the whole range of it, because this is mostly the hydraulic oils range. And uh, it's pretty widely used, I mean, you know, worldwide, using this ISO viscosity system, uh, with the notable exception of our friends at Mobile, who are very special, and their numbering system calls us 24, 25, and 26. All right, but that's just mobile. Okay. Uh, the second thing to note about industrial um, hydraulic fluids is they are not all equal in terms of quality. Um, generally, and that's, that's even true within a given supplier, and generally, you've kind of, from a given supplier, would probably have choices between kind of a good, better, and best. Okay three different quality grades of product. Maybe more, you know, they, someone could divide into four. Some people really only offer two. But, uh, but the whole market, there is this whole range from cheap stuff up to ex stuff that's so expensive you'd think it was a synthetic, but it's not. Um, and these are due to a number of factors, okay? This isn't, this isn't made up stuff. Uh, the base stock quality itself can vary, okay? The, the higher end stuff that you get might actually even be a semi-synthetic base stock that, that's going in there. And uh, you'd expect the base stock itself might have a real good oxidation life. The low end one, and I'm not anti low end hydraulic oils because they, they have a very appropriate places. If you've got a system that's pouring hydraulic oil out just about as fast as you can put it in, you don't want to be putting in that stuff. <laughs> you know, you want to put in this stuff, right? But this stuff, uh, one of the, the people formulating this may be buying base stocks just from whoever's got the lowest price that week. And it's going to vary from batch to batch and load to load, too. Um, but, and, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying you should be aware that that could be the case. There, there are differences in base stocks. There are also differences in additive quality, okay, who the additive came from that they're using in their system. Okay, now, this... Um, um, related to that, but different, is how much additive is going in, okay? These guys are in the, you saw that range of, of stuff we had. These guys are the guys at, at 320 parts per million zinc. Over here, you're at 650 parts per million zinc, okay? So how much you put in there. How much of that oxidation inhibitor might be in there? There's a little bit over there. There's a bunch more over here, okay? So, um, your variances can come from base stocks and additives. And then the fourth one, or fourth, the third thing is quality control. Um, again, this stuff gets formulated. I mean, you, you got guys uh, putting this together in a tub in their backyard and selling cheap hydraulic oil. It's that easy to do. So it can be done. You're buying this stuff. This stuff may even have been filtered down to a very tight ISO cleanliness level at the factory and put into a specially treated sealed drum for that purpose. Um, uh, there's, a, there's definitely quality control differences across the range. Again, not saying it's wrong, but you got to pay attention to uh, who you're buying it from and, and keeping an eye on, on the product itself. Okay. Um, and there are also uh, industry standards in hydraulic oils used in in industry as opposed to 
some of the off-road stuff. Um, and the, the specs are almost always driven by the people who build hydraulic pumps and design and manufacture hydraulic systems. Okay, so this is the stuff, this is the stuff on the data sheet uh, that you pay attention to with a hydraulic oil for an industrial type of application. Um, these are some international standards about how, about defining what the hydraulic oil is supposed to have in it or how it's supposed to behave. So those are some other things that are found in, in the industrial setting, but not the mining type setting. And a lot of the specialty products show up in the industrial arena as well. So for instance, fire resistant oils, right? Fire resistant oils largely used in industrial settings, not exactly, uh, um, not exactly used in agriculture for instance. Uh, also a, a wider use of synthetics. You're more likely to find synthetics used in industrial settings. Um, uh, people, uh, plastic injection molders, plastic injection molding machines have these high performance, high powered, high pressure hydraulic systems as part of them and generally they're trying to trying to uh, maximize life in those systems because th that's all about throughput. So you don't have time to change hydraulic oil every other day on those things. And biodegradable products um, often seen in the industrial side of things as part of the specialty products. Okay, on the off-road side of things, um, kind of the... Uh, the, the, the granddaddy of specifications and requirements for off-road is Caterpillar TO4 fluid. Um, uh, Caterpillar's um, also sometimes called a power shift fluid. <coughs> Caterpillar has, I guess, call it a philosophy of, of having these fluids that are multi-purpose and can be used in, in multiple places um, and with specifications written around that. And these TO4 fluids uh, do a very good job in hydraulic systems, both the, their t the 10W viscosity grade and the 30 viscosity grade. Okay, um, these these viscosity grades, because these viscosity numbers, the SAE numbers, are designed really or came really from the world of engine oils, right? As a but they actually map over to the industrial side of things, so that a 10W is about the same as a ISO 32 and the SAE 30 is about the same as an ISO 68. So these are oils still in that same viscosity range, but very good hydraulic performance. Um, and the CAT TO4 specification calls for a, a huge chunk of anti-wear and rust and oxidation inhibitors in there. So they make really good hydraulic oils. Um, you'll also see truck engine oil called for as a hydraulic oil in off-road equipment, all right? Uh, 10W engine oil is really commonly used, okay? All right, anybody guess what the downside of using 10W engine oil is as a hydraulic oil? As it's loaded with detergent, right? And so if you get water in there, it's not gonna be able to split from the water. And again, it's making a, an estimation, an understanding that, you know, we'd still rather use 10W in the hydraulic system because if somebody accidentally hooks the hydraulic spout into the crankcase opening, you don't have a crankcase full of regular hydraulic oil, right? At least you've got something that's pretty close to an, or it's an engine oil chemistry formulation in there and it's fully compatible. It's just lower in viscosity than it should be. So that's that's the trade-off that's made to, uh, to, to reduce that risk. And in fact, the use of a 15W40 is kind of the same thing. You can reduce inventory if you use 15W40 as a hydraulic oil. Now you do got to stop here and say, wait a second, that 15W40, which at operating temperature is going to behave like a 40. Now a 40 oil in that ISO system is way up at ISO 150, which is way heavier than a hydraulic oil should be, okay? Well, here's the, I'll say it's a dirty little secret, but it's not dirty and it's not little and it's barely a secret. Um, you remember our, our tentacled 
monsters that get bigger as they heat up a little bit, right? Okay, that's how we made our 15W40, a multi-grade. We started with that 15W. We got the additives in there so it behaves like a 40. Well, the, the viscosity modifiers used in engine oils, right? Not in hydraulic oils, but in engine oils, are susceptible to being chopped up in a hydraulic pump. So you put 15W40 in there in your hydraulic system, and it runs through a few times, and it starts to get chopped up, and pretty soon it's a 15W30, or maybe a 15W20, which is right in the sweet spot of the viscosity range for hydraulic oils. So now you have a product that if somebody accidentally puts that in the crankcase, <laughs> there's no foul at all, right? You just don't have a hydraulic oil on site. So that's one of, that would be an advantage of having it, of using it, a 15W or 15W40 as a hydraulic oil. Again, you're still, you're still running that risk of that water, the water ingress on there and, and those problems in your hydraulic system. And then the, uh, the third uh, broad class that's often used in off-road equipment as a hydraulic fluid is automatic transmission fluid. Automatic transmission fluids, viscosity is right there in that 10W range, okay? Very nice hydraulic oil range. It's loaded up with anti-wear. I mean, it, in most current uh, ATFs, there's a lot of non-zinc anti-wear, but it's still anti-wear. It's loaded up with oxidation inhibitors, right? I mean, I, you know, um, ATF is designed to be put into uh, automatic transmission and not changed for a real long time, even though it gets churned and heated and stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great product. So it makes a pretty decent hydraulic oil in certain hydraulic systems, and you'll find off-road equipment calling for ATF as a hydraulic oil from time to time. Okay. Um, and you'll also sometimes see off-road equipment call for hydraulic tractor fluid, even though that's the main province of the third category here, agricultural, okay? All right, agricultural uh, use is almost always around this stuff called HTF or THF, so hydraulic tractor fluid or tractor hydraulic fluid, or UTTO, which is universal tractor and transmission oil, uh, is what that stands for. Um, and it's kind of, I think of it as the duck-billed platypus of oils because uh, it does lots of stuff in addition to being a hydraulic oil when it's inside a piece of ag equipment, okay? It lubricates the transmission, okay? So it's got gear lubrication as part of its job. It lubricates final drives in there. Uh, it's got to lubricate the wet brake system in, in, in that thing and, and lubricates steering systems. So it's a common reservoir that's feeding all these places and doing all this stuff in addition to the hydraulics, okay? One of its important features as a result of having to do a lot of this stuff, particularly with transmission in the final drive, it's loaded with anti-wear additive, loaded with zinc. So, so when we have a typical hydraulic oil is three to 600 parts per million, and we said a heavy-duty truck is 1,200 parts per million, um, uh, hydraulic tractor fluid is 1,400 to 1,500 parts per million, okay? Loaded with anti-wear. Um, its viscosity is not standard, standardized by the ISO system, but it's somewhere between a 46 and a 68, okay? So it's, it's got a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good viscosity backbone for a hydraulic oil, and it doesn't have to be used just in agricultural systems. Um, it also has some of those viscosity modifier additives in there, making it a multi-grade, probably around a 20W30 for most of these product, most of the products you see out there. It might be a 10W30 for some of them if they've really done a good job at getting their cold flow properties in line. Okay? And as I mentioned before, you'll see this specified sometimes in the off-road and mining and construction sectors calling for this. Uh, there's a Caterpillar specification that's for... Uh, hydraulic, for essentially hydraulic tractor fluid. I can't remember what they, what they designate, designate theirs at. Um, and it may or may not be dyed. Okay, this, this will vary by manufacturer. We got a product that we carry from Chevron that is dyed. 
and we got a product we carry from Philips 66 that has not died. So it's not, a, not an industry standard on that at all. Um, in fact, what there are is a bunch of standards. If you look at all the manufacturers, everybody's got their own standard for this type of universal tractor transmission oil. And what's fortunate is that most of their specifications are very similar to each other. So it's not too difficult to formulate one product that meets all this stuff, okay? That not only meets it all, um, but is compatible as well. Because if you think about how these things are used, okay, you've got your tractor, you hook your tractor up to some sort of a thrasher, and what you do as part of that is you hook up the quick connect with the hydraulic system because your hydraulic system on your tractor is going to operate several functions on the thrasher. Well, what you've just done then is you've integrated in whatever hydraulic oil was already in this system is now part of your system, right? And you might use this and disconnect it and hook up over here to another implement. And now you're going to hook up there, and now your systems, again, are going to all get blended together. All right? So having similar products and being compatible is pretty important in this in this neck of the woods. Okay, and that's all I got to say about agricultural hydraulic oils. Um, any questions about the oils themselves, the formulations? Okay, anybody other than Matt have any? No. <laughs> yes, sir. Anybody hear that question? The question was, would you consider using hydraulic tractor fluid <coughs> in place of a AW68 hydraulic oil because of the higher zinc levels? The answer is uh, quite possibly, S particularly if you suspect you need the higher anti-wear levels. Okay, so if you've got something that runs high pressure, runs hot, gets lots of pressure spikes suddenly coming at it, that would definitely be that would definitely be a good reason, a good criteria. Um, the the where you may want to pay attention to is make sure you got the viscosity. Hydraulic tractor fluid is a slightly lower viscosity than 68. So you need to make sure you're at 68, you're not on the narrow edge because it's running so hot, that that may be an issue. But um, that, would actually, that could actually be a very good consideration. That would be a reasonable substitution, especially if, you're, especially if your hydraulic oil that you've been using is one of the, uh, the 300 part per million ones with poor oxidation life because there's a, a, most hydraulic tractor fluids would have a much better slug of rust and oxidation additive in it. Okay, were the man, okay, the question is about zinc-free hydraulic systems. And am I understanding this right? The manufacturer of the system says they want you to use a zinc-free oil. What is the zinc going to do inside the system? Okay. I would, I'd have to, 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 to be 100% sure, I'd have to research it. But what I've observed with some of, the, some of these manufacturers just think, they think you should get away from zinc, and their own proprietary hydraulic oils don't contain zinc. So they may they may ship it out with they may ship it out with a zinc-free oil in there. Okay. Yeah, obviously we don't want to mix fluids like that, but it's nothing mechanical. I that's and that the good you know, the question is is there something mechanical or is there something physical that would be incompatible with a zinc-containing additive? In most cases, there would not be. Okay. They, you, you, you're right in that you generally don't want to mix a zinc-type hydraulic oil with a non-zinc-type hydraulic oil. Okay, there are some chemical incompatibilities that can happen at the additive level. Um, now, draining, draining one out and replacing with the other is fine. But, uh, um, but as far as something like a lining or uh, uh, fittings or something like that being a problem, I know, I know of nothing like that. I haven't read anything like that in any of the trade industry magazines. That, that, the, that, that the, man, the OEM very likely could say, hey, I want you to use a zinc-free hydraulic oil because zinc-free hydraulic oils are not cheap. They're very well made. They, you know, someone who's making one of those is also putting in plenty of rust and oxidation inhibition. They're running plenty of tests on it. 
and the OEM wants him to use an oil of that quality as opposed to using the 300 part per million um, uh, poor quality stuff over here because this stuff's going to have zinc in it so he can drive them towards a better product by saying stay out of zinc. Okay, so that's, that's entirely likely. 